please welcome Jennifer Rubin, yeah. Ira Hyden, Rodney Eastman, Ken Sagos, Brooke Bundy, John Saxon, Heather Langenkamp, and the real Freddy Krueger. having a good time? I got to work with extraordinary actors, uh, established and and already stars, and young young people like Johnny Depp and, and Heather who were just starting out. And it was great for me because between the actors and the directors, uh, it kept me fresh and it kept me on my toes. I mean, some of our directors, we forget, you know, uh, we had Chuck Russell before The Mask. We had Rennie Harlan before Die Hard. You know, we had Wes Craven right at the beginning of his ascendancy. And wonderful young people like Rachel Talalay, the gifted Rachel Talalay. And uh, so it was, it was really fun for me to every year or two to be thrown in with, with all this new talent. And uh, that kept me on my toes. And that was what, what was, the, when I look back on it, that was what was really rewarding. Over here at the kids' wall. Yeah, how was Wes Craven to work with uh, when you worked with him? Well, we start. Um, John and Heather, you know, actually, I think Heather actually probably met Wes before I did, you know. You know, it's intimidating working for someone who is so, uh, one, their vision is really strong, that you just really, uh, you realize how 
undeveloped your own imagination is, and I think that's how I felt when I worked with Wes Craven, because like when you're 18, or 17, when I was, you know, just a teenager, you look at people like, like Robert and John and, and Wes, who had been involved in the movies, you know, much longer than I had, and they saw the picture in their minds in a way that I couldn't, I couldn't do it yet. I didn't have the skill to like understand how, you know, acting translated to the big screen. And uh, I think Wes, of all the directors I've ever worked for, he had such a strong idea of what he wanted. And, and I've always, I've always tried as I grew up and got tried to get better at what I did to have that same kind of vision about, you know, whatever you do, whether it's, you know, you're planning to build a, a shed or, you know, whatever it is, just to have it in your mind and have it, you know, already built in your mind and then get it done in real life. That's how he was. John, when, when did you meet Wes? I've never heard. I met him the very first day uh, of a, a, a cemetery scene. In the picture. Yeah. And I didn't know who he was. I went around asking. I said, who's the director? And they said, he's over there. And I said, oh, okay. And I walked over to him and I said, you know, I really, really like this script. I like the, the dream a aspect of it all that. I did have a kind of a sense of reservation beyond the dream thing uh, as to how it would play out. But um, that's what happened. We started, uh, I started working with the picture in that, in that day. And uh, I thought it was very interesting in many, many, many ways throughout, yes. I, I'd been hanging out at a New Wave bar uh, on La Brea uh, in LA, and uh, I was working in a play with George Went uh, from Cheers, and, and, we, and it was this bizarre crew of out of work, or sporadically out of work actors. Uh, Christopher Lloyd from Taxi was there, and they had two monitors, over the bar, and they ran continuous loops from Eraserhead by David Lynch, and from The Hills Have Eyes, you know. And after a couple of drinks and waiting for the band to play, you know, I you know, was kind of mesmerized by these films. So my concept of Wes Craven back in those days was sort of like a, a, a David Lynch guy. That's how we thought of, of Wes, or at least people that I knew. And then when I met him, he was sort of like a this kind of like erudite you know, Ralph Lauren professor, <laughs> professor yeah, you know, uh, and it was a, that was a whole different thing, but he always had, uh, even up until the last film that, that I worked with Wes on, he always sort of kept the 14-year-old boy alive in him. And this is a guy who, if you've ever visited his house, had the most extraordinary coffee table books. Uh, and, and was always asking and inquisitive about wonderful things that were going on in the wor world, politically, travel, just interesting things, but there was still this sort of like 14-year-old fanboy alive and well in Wes that I really responded to. And when you're doing a horror movie, you know, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm dragging, you know, Brooke's head around, <laughs> and or I'm chasing Heather, you know, barefoot, and Heather's stepping on, like, uh, set nails, and they're going through her foot. To have Wes there to, like, make peace, and to, and to make a good joke, to crack a joke, or crack wise, or to be a script doctor, uh, really kind of relieve the tension and the pressure of low-budget horror movie making. And Wes is... I guess in the purest sense of notour, he's a director-writer, so he can always fix the dialogue on the set, which is nice. Uh, and you're not really, you don't have the pressure of having to improvise, because Wes gives you a line, a, a different line that's, that's better than the line that he wrote originally. You know, so you, can, you, you get kind of spoiled by that, too, I might add. Well, and then, I mean, in Nightmare 3, because he wrote the original script, we have to mention, too, that Wes knew how to write for teenagers, about teenagers. And you know, he, Nightmare One, he had his own teenager, his daughter Jessica and his son Jonathan were 